We know that it doesn't work. The parents know that that's not working. The dog knows that it's not working. <laughs> but who doesn't know that it's not working? The child. So when will the child change their behavior? When they figure out that what they're doing is not working. All right? This is related to, to diversity and working intergenerationally. I want you to know that I'm on the right path. So uh, I just want to keep you, you focused on that. But, but people don't change their behavior until they recognize that there needs to be some kind of change in that behavior. All right? So here, here are some keys to my approach uh, of working with folks. First, I know that people can learn, change, and grow. And they typically learn, change, and grow in the area of their strength. So what they're good at, they typically get better at doing that. Um, where, we, where we're not as strong, we typically learn how to manage that more effectively. right? Uh, but we learn the most in the areas where, uh, where we have strengths. Um, that all human behavior is goal-directed. That any time that we're doing something, there is a, a, a purpose behind it. Even if it's not uh, cognitively uh, in, in our, 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 the front of our mind, we have a purpose or a rationale for doing the things that we do. Um, next, people do what makes sense to them, even if it doesn't make sense to who? You, right? Making sense to you has no, it has no bearing on, on why and, and how people try to accomplish their goals. Um, next, attitude is a response to a goal. All right. What have you been taught about what an attitude is? What have you been taught about what an attitude is? What is an attitude? Okay, it's a learned behavior, it's a response. What were you going to say, sir? You were going to, is it, okay. Have you been accused of having an attitude at any point? <laughs> Right? We've often been accused of having an attitude, and I remember as a, as, a, uh, as a teenager, my parents would say I had a lot of attitude. And so uh, I, uh, they would send me to my room and say, boy, go to your room until you learn how to act. And I'd be in my room for a while, and then I'd step out and I'd say, to me or not to me. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in my room. <laughs> but that wasn't what they were talking about. Um, what they, and it took me a long time to figure it out because I don't know that they were as articulate as they could have been around telling me what an attitude was. And then one day I figured it out. So on, on Sunday, uh, my dad was, uh, was my pastor. And so on Sunday, we would go to church from 7.30 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. We'd stop at 3 o'clock for chicken, not because we're black, but because chicken is delicious. <laughs> So, so Sunday is church all day. So I asked my dad uh, to borrow the car Friday night. And because my dad loves me, what does he say? No. Oh, he loves me. He says, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right? so, so I get the keys. I go hang out with my friends. I put gas in the car. I come in before curfew. And my dad says, I have what kind of an attitude? A good attitude or a positive attitude. Consequently, what do I say about my dad's attitude? And he's got a good attitude as well, right? So I have a good attitude, he has a good attitude. Sunday, my best friend Dexter calls me and says, Andre, can you pick me up for the movies? What do I know about Sunday? Church all day, right? Um, but Jesus is my friend, so I, I, I'm going to ask Jesus for a favor this one time, right? <laughs> I'm like, okay, Jesus, hook a brother up. And so I, I, I go to my dad and I say, Dad. And you know, I ask him, I say, Dad, can I borrow the car? And what does my dad say? No. Not only does he say no, but he gives me the lecture about how I'm leading people to hell. <laughs> in, in my household, every negative consequence, the ultimate consequence was going to hell. And either you could take yourself there or my father would be obliged to send you. <laughs> And so now, what does my father say about my attitude? That it's a bad attitude. And now what do I say about my dad's attitude? That he has a bad attitude. So what is it that actually determines an attitude? Starts with G and ends in O. Your goal determines your attitude. 
For example, anyone been around teenagers? Right? When you give a teenager what they want, it's almost as if they, they purr. Right? They want to cuddle and like, you know, they even get a little drool in the corner of their mouths, right? Uh, because they've achieved what they wanted. Have you ever denied a teenager what they wanted? <laughs> Funkiest attitude, and, and it's just so mad. You're like, is, this came out of me? This is part of me? Right? Yeah. Yeah, did I raise that boy? Um, so, so when we accomplish our goals, we have good attitudes, and when we don't accomplish our goals, we have bad attitudes. So as, as, uh, as folks who interact with the public, this is an important thing to, to remember or to know, right? So if you have a, a, a client or a member of the community who is interacting with you and they have a bad attitude, what is the one thing that you know about them for sure? That they are not accomplishing their goal, all right? And so as a, as a helper, as a person who, who gets paid to, to be of assistance, that's when you start kicking in. And there are two responses that you can have to someone who has a bad attitude. The first is to do what? Okay, so yeah, we're going to fight fire with fire, right? <laughs> we'll all be burnt up. You know? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. We'll be blind and toothless. Right? So, so, what do, so I, first I know that this person with a bad attitude is not accomplishing their goal. So if, using that same logic, if there's something that I can do to have, help them get a good attitude, which is what? Help them reach their goal. All right? So if I can help them reach their goal, then they will have a good attitude, and I have fulfilled my mission in life. Yay! All right? However, what if their goal is not reachable, or given the confines of, of my responsibilities, it's not anything I can do about that? Then what do I do as a helper? Try to help this Say it again. I heard it over here. Help them change their goal. Right? Because if, if I give somebody a goal, what are they going to do with that? If I push you in the hallway, what's your natural reaction to push back? Right? So if I give somebody a goal, they typically won't accept it. But part of my job is to help them find a new goal. And that will change their attitude. Is that helpful? Does that make sense? Okay, cool. This is related to generational diversity and those things. So I just want to make sure we tie that stuff together. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about what diversity is not and then offer you a new way of thinking about diversity. Because we are now in the promised land. But we got to slay some giants and some monsters so that we can relax and enjoy our milk and honey, all right? So first of all, diversity is not political correctness. Um, a, a lot of times, first of all, what is political correctness? Has anyone ever heard of that term before? Okay, so what is political correctness? Saying the right thing. Saying something without offending someone else. What else? Has anyone, um, because I've come to, to, to a point to start to understand that political correctness is actually just a bad joke, right? I mean, because janitors aren't janitors anymore. They're custodial engineers. And I'm all about, you know, giving titles and, 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 and propping up things, but they have to be worthy to be propped up, right? I'm, I'm still trying to, to figure out what's the difference between uh, people of color and colored people. But that, that's just me. That, I'm just trying to figure it out. That's just me, right? Um, so, so it's not about political correctness. Because uh, I, I recall being in a, in a training at the county, actually, and a woman stands up and she says, Andre, I want to know why all the colored people are moving into my neighborhood. And how do you think the audience responded when she stood up and asked that question? Were you guys there? <laughs> that's exactly what they did, right? They gasped. <gasps> oh. And why did they do that? Because, yeah, she wasn't using the right word. She wasn't being politically correct. However, as she stood there and I looked at her, it was very apparent to me that she did not have a lot of stamps in her passport. <laughs> 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 that 
that she didn't have the, the, the fancy lexicon and the fancy way of speaking and all this kind of stuff. And so she asked a question that other people in the room had, and she asked it from a pure heart. So what was my responsibility to her in terms of responding to her question? I answered her question. I can pull her aside later and talk about the political correct stuff and blah, blah, blah. But I was more important in making sure that her heart was intact because she was courageous. And I wanted to honor her courageousness. Because I've also been in contact with people who have um, political correctness down to a silence. But as they're speaking to you, your skin just crawls <laughs> with disgust because you can hear the darkness and the nastiness in their heart, right? So diversity is not about political correctness. It's also not about blaming guilt. How many people have been in diversity training of some sort, either in a class or, or as a part of your work? Please raise your hand. Okay. You are the people I have to heal. <laughs> Because all too often in diversity conversations, they are so filled with blame and guilt. You know, white people are bad, and people of color are noble for suffering with white people, right? Um, what I would like to offer is that um, do babies care who changes them? No. You change a baby, they're just as happy as they want to be. And we've been spending way too much time blaming, you know, illegitimate parents, because kids are always legitimate, um, on, on, on the birth of this, this, you know, racism and the sexism and, and homophobia and bigotry, uh, religious bigotry. We've been pointing way too many fingers instead of actually dealing with the baby. All right? um, diversity is not about therapy. It's not just about the, the, the racial construct of black and white, because there are much more... Um, diverse issues that we have to talk about in terms of diversity, that it just doesn't boil down to black and white. And also that that's an artificial racial construct that we've created to, uh, to identify people differently. Right? Um, genetically, there is no real difference between um, so-called black folks and so-called white folks. Um, no, there is a difference between someone from the Iron Ranch and someone from the city. <laughs> but that's a whole other another training. That's another training. Um, also, diversity is not meritocracy. And meritocracy is basically the concept that if you work hard enough, you can be just like me. <laughs> Why is that problematic? Yeah, maybe you don't want to be like me. Right? How do I get to set the standard of what it is to be normal or to be successful? It would be a, a, a shame for... Um, for LeBron James to have to play basketball the way I do, right? <laughs> that would be that would be horrible. Um, so it's not about meritocracy um, because there are also barriers that oftentimes keep people from actually achieving so-called success as a dominant group might define it. And lastly, diversity is not about tolerance. Um, what does tolerance mean? To deal with, to to accept. What else does tolerance mean? Anything to ignore, okay? To accept anything that goes. To accept anything that goes. All right. So what, what I would what I like to offer, and, and I say diversity is not about tolerance. And people get nervous when I talk about that because people build their careers on this. There are books about it. We talk about it in church. We talk about it in school, in temple, in synagogue, and we're always uh, about this tolerance. My brother-in-law came to visit. I tolerated that dude. <laughs> Why? I knew when he was going home. <laughs> Tolerance means to put up with until we no longer have to. Are our communities getting any less diverse? I would say no. Are our human uh, relations getting more complicated? I would say yes. And so tolerance is, um, it, it's not the end-all be-all. It's like standing on the cliff without going into the actual promised land. And so what I, what I would I hear some of you saying, you know, is it political correctness uh, a good thing? Is it meritocracy that people try to work up to the, where the rest of us are and put in good effort? Um, isn't that a good thing? And isn't tolerance like a good first step? And my, uh, my response to you is that babies drink milk. 
And why do babies drink milk? Because it's nourishment. It's the earliest form of, of nourishment. And so tolerance and meritocracy and political correctness are great first steps. But at some point, babies move from milk to tofu. <laughs> I prefer the bean curd myself. Uh, but we move from the simplest things to, to more complicated ways of, of, of digesting information. And so what I'd like to offer you is something that's a bit more sophisticated than some than these old things, but a lot more simple than we give ourselves credit for. All right? Um, so I, uh, I like um, Wheel of Fortune, so I put a Wheel of Fortune puzzle up here, and I want to see if you can solve it. All right? So when you have the phrase, the word or phrase, or the words, just go ahead and put them out. That's right. Dignity and honor of being human. And so as we, we talk about generational, our generational work, and we talk about dealing with the public, we talk about um, how to interact with all these multitudes and facets of, of, uh, of communities that are moving into to Minnesota, um, I cannot be expected to know everything about everybody. Like we have this huge influx of, of, of people from Burma. I thought Burma had changed its name from something else to something else, but now it's back to Burma. So how am I supposed to know about everything about these, these people? And the fact of the matter is, I'm not supposed to. I can't. But I will do what I can do, which is these four things. And so first of all, uh, what is dignity? Treating someone as an equal? Dignity. It's respect, okay? Dignity. I heard self-respect, okay? Is dignity something that you have or something that you can give? It is a fact though, right? Dignity basically says you have the right to exist and that's okay. Um, I, I, many of you probably see these folks on the side of the road as well as I do. And they're the people with the signs, the cardboard signs. And typically, what's written on their cardboard signs? We'll work for food. What else? Homeless need help. Need a drink. Okay, when they're honest. <laughs> right? What else is written on those signs? Okay, family to feed. You know, sometimes they ask for money, right? And so I see those people, and I give them tons of things. And what do you think that I give them? I give them dignity. And the, and the reason I, I give them dignity before I give them cash is because I, it, it, it's part of my belief that they oftentimes feel invisible to the larger community. And so whenever I get a chance, and, and I don't encourage you to do this unless you're in a, in a safe situation, but uh, I'll, I'll crack the window and, and have a conversation with them. I'll give them a card for some resources that I have uh, from the county. If you need something, here's, here's my county card. Um, here's some, some resources. Um, I, 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 I make eye contact when I can't have a conversation to let them know that I see them. I give them a genuine smile, not the fake one that, you know, sometimes we do. <laughs> right? Because I want them to know that someone sees them. Because if you don't give people dignity, they will try and take it. And so in, in, in the case of, and this may happen to you because it, it happens to me quite often, that uh, I'm at a stop sign or at a stoplight, and there is a group of teenagers trying to cross the street. Now, I, 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 I used to think that they didn't cross the street as, as, as quickly as they could because their pants were too low. Right? You know, that's what I thought at first, but I figured out they can really hype those puppies up when it's time to go. Right? Um, but I don't know if this happens, but it seems as though they just, when they get right in front of my car is when they slow down. Right? So I'll be, you know, hustling along and they get in front of my car and then they, and then they glare at me. You know, like, Right? As they're moving really slow. What they don't know is they have really good car insurance. <laughs> um, um, but what they're saying to me is, uh, as, as a young person, I'm looking at you as an adult because you don't ever see me any other time. And this is the place where I can have some power and control uh, as I cross the street. So I will take my dignity from you at that point. All right? 
Um, what is honor? Pride. Okay. Honor. Disrespect. Okay. Who in our society have we said that we will give honor to? Veterans. Right? Because they go and they fight wars on our behalf. Servicemen and women, we will give honor to. Our, uh, our, our parents and grandparents, we said we will give them honor. So it's respect, but respect at a high level. All right? Um, B, please raise your hand if you can answer yes to these two questions. Raise your hand if you purchased the ticket or you passed the test that made you eligible to be born on this planet. <laughs> None of us have done anything to bring ourselves here. We all accepted an invitation. I don't want to think about how that invitation came. It's disgusting. <laughs> but we all accepted an invitation to be here. We're trying to figure it out. Right? And we're trying to figure out the last part, which is human. Now, when you look at human in the dictionary, you find interesting things. That it has actual two definitions. One is being a, a biped, uh, having opposable thumbs, a big brain, and a belly button. If you ever encounter a person without a belly button, be concerned. <laughs> Homo sapiens sapien, the one who knows that they know that they exist, the now. But you also find that human is also an adjective. And what do adjectives do? They describe the now. All right? So in what ways and what things do we do to, to try to, to teach our, the, the babies of our species about what it means to be human? What do we expect those, those um, baby humans uh, to take on? What, what characteristics do we expect for them to have to be included into our, our human family? So what kinds of things do we teach babies about what it means to be human? That it's okay to make mistakes. What else? To be responsible. What else? What's that? Respect. We teach them respect. What else do we teach them? How to help themselves. To be nice. To be kind. We ultimately teach them the, the golden rule. Do unto others in the best way that you want them to do unto you. Right? Yeah. Um, and so... We offer them dignity, honor, being human. Now, what I want you to think about is, what if your life was a little bit different than, than how it's turned out now? What if you went back and you looked over your life, and everybody in your life gave you dignity and honor for being human? Not because you could do a thing, not because you were the right sh size or shape, or you were the, 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 the right age, but they gave you dignity and honor for being who you are. Would your life be different than it is right now? It's rhetorical. It's rhetorical. But now I want you to think about the people that we work with. What if in the interaction that we have with them, they, we can guarantee them that they will get dignity and honor because of who they are? Might that be a life changer? Because I can imagine, you know, that there's some, um, it, it's funny, I was doing some work with Columbia Heights, and uh, there was a, um, a church that um, had a lot of Hispanic um, congregants. And so the, um, the, the congregation, the, the Hispanic congregation felt that the police were targeting them for racial profiling. And so they, were, they felt, you know, there was this unjust stuff and, and all this stuff. And so guess what we did as, as the diversity coordinator for Anoka County in Columbia Heights? We sat down and talked with them. And guess what our number one tool was when we came to sit down and talk about their perceptions of what was going on? Dignity and honor because they exist. And you, you, will, you will be surprised that the lessons that your grandparents tried to teach you, your parents tried to teach you about how to relate with human beings, um, that stuff actually works. Being nice and being kind to people actually works. But here's the funny thing. Dick 
giving me an honor because I, I've often heard people say, well, if you want respect for me, or if you want dignity or honor for me, you got to earn it. Has anyone ever heard someone say you have to earn my respect? Right? The, 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 the funny thing about that is that respect can never be earned. Because if, if you ask, you know, individuals, you know, if, if I do this, this, and this, is that respect? They may say, yeah, or they may go, mm, no, you need to do this, this, and this. Which means that there, there's actually no, no rubric, no, no, no ruler at which I can measure respect. And so respect and, and dignity and honor has to be given and, and not earned. All right? And then the, the biggest trick is we have to give respect to people who are being disrespectful to us. It is not authentic, authentic you know, re respect until it costs us something. And the funny thing is, you know, people will, will say, you know, well, I'm going to stand up for myself because I don't want to be a doormat. Has anyone ever heard someone say that? Yeah. Which I think that's really interesting because that's, that's a limited way of thinking about the world. Because what do doormats do? What can you do on a doormat? What are the, the, the verbs associated with a, a doormat? You step on it, right? You walk on it, right? But if you look at yourself in, in terms of not necessarily just being a, a doormat, but you can also be a bridge, then that changes how you, how you see things. Here's an example. So I live in Mounds View, and I, um, I'm running some errands, and so I decided to get some early lunch. And so I, I go into this, uh, this bar restaurant, and at the end of the bar is a guy who's all red-faced, slurred speech, and it's 10.30. This guy's a mess at 10.30, right? So a couple of things I know about this guy. One is that uh, he's been here before and that he obviously knows these people in this place. And so I, um, you know, I, I just make a note of that and I close my menu and give it to my white staff and the guys move from the end of the bar right next to me. <sighs> now, you know, being, you know, I wrestled in high school, I played football so I can get down. Um, so I'm not afraid of, of the, this drunk guy, but I, I am concerned because they're pretty unpredictable. And so, um, you know, I do what we do in Minnesota. We start small talk. You know, we're talking about the weather and, and so forth and so on. And then he breaks into his thesis for sitting next to me. And he says, I don't like niggers. I did the same thing. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. I was like, whoo. And, and I'm like, that's one heck of an introduction. <laughs> and so I, uh, I take a step back and I, um, I, I try to change the subject, you know, because that's very uncomfortable. But something in my spirit said, go back to that. So I go back to it and I said, well, sir, when you use that word, what are you talking about? Describe it. And so he goes on, you know, welfare, uh, unemployed, using the system, ghetto, uneducated, all this stuff. And so I asked him, I said, well, sir, do you know any white people who fit that description? And he says, yeah, yeah. I said, how about those twins? You know, so we, we kind of work about sports and stuff, and we go on to other stuff. And he turns to me again, and he says, you know what? I don't like niggers, but I like you. <laughs> so now I'm really confused. <laughs> now, I am not encouraging you to use that word. I just want to say that, right? Because it's not licensed to use that word. But, uh, but so I was really confused and I said, well, sir, what about me do you, do you like or do you appreciate? And he said, you know, you have a good head on your shoulders, you're intelligent, um, you know, you seem to be going someplace and blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, sir, what if all the, the people who you think look like me that you've met, all the people that you've met that you think look like me were idiots? And everybody else that you don't know who looks like me, is a lot like me. And he looks at me and he says, I got a pee. <laughs> so he gets up and he goes to the restroom and I'm like, Phew. you know, so I'm trying to get my check as quick as I can. I finally get the check, I sign it, I'm on my way out the door and guess who meets me at the door? <laughs> it's the same guy. But he looks a little bit different. His hair is combed over to the side, he's got water triplets on his face and he, um, 
He reaches out to me with a damp napkin and he says, I have chickens. If you ever need fresh eggs, give me a call. So I take the napkin, I go my way, and he goes his way. What did I do for that man? Well, let's back up. What if, would, I, would you have understood after him calling me that dirty name, that I, would you have understood if I gave him a piece of my mind? How dare you come? Right? You would have understood if I had done that. Had I done that, what would have happened for him? I would have validated everything that he thought about people who he thinks look and act like me. Right? I would have been justified in being a doormat. You're not going to walk over me. You're not going to blah, blah, blah. But my choice was to become a bridge. And so in, 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 in that small little sacrifice of being called that, 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 that nasty name, I was able to create a place where he could actually move from where he was to another place. Now, will he stop using that word? Probably not. Will he think differently about the people who he's describing when he uses that word? Probably. Right? One of the things that, that we've been tricked into is to, to making the assumptions about the things that, that, that we do um, without ever being critically, um, without being a critical analyzer of the stuff that we're doing. And so what I, I would encourage us to do is to not necessarily think of ourselves as, uh, as doormats, but we have opportunities to, to build bridges and to help people get places. All right? So, cool. Um, I only have a couple more minutes. I need to get to, to the juice of sale. <laughs> oh. I am a gadget dude. I love gadgets. How much time do I have left? Is that about a half hour, 20 minutes? 25 minutes. All right, we, we're going to crank this out. Any questions so far? Oh, come on. Something I had to say was controversial or at least got you thinking. Yes. Oh, okay. Yep. Just like you just did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I here. With him and I said, I asked him why he did this. Oh, what did you do? He didn't give me an answer. Okay. So whose house was that? Mine. Yeah. Whose house was that? <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that it, it, you know, particularly around that word, that's really interesting, is that um, now, are there any people who will consider themselves white? Can you raise your hand? Okay. One of the things that, uh, that allows stuff like that to happen is this thing called white guilt. And it's so funny because white people feel guilty about something that they didn't do. Which is interesting, right? So um, I believe that there are um, words that people use that are unacceptable in any context, in any situation. And words like that don't get used in my house. They don't get used in my presence. Um, and so one of the things, okay, so here's, here's a story, right? So I'm um, using that word as an example. I'm at the Mall of America at the Rack. Anyone been to the Rack? Okay, they have like shoe heaven. You know, just rows and rows of shoes. And so I'm, I'm at the Rack, and on the other 
on another aisle, I hear a group of teenagers, black teenagers, using that word, right? And so, um, I, you know, I'm a diversity trainer. I'm a, I'm a person who, you know, fights for justice. So I say to myself, if they say it one more time, I have to do something about it. And so what happens when you put your mouth out there, <laughs> right? Typically your butt has to follow me. So ultimately they said it one more time. Now, I've, I've been a teacher, I've been, you know, all sorts of stuff, so I'm not a, a, afraid of kids or, or confrontation, but again, it's unpredictable. You never know what you're gonna run into. So I, uh, I garner up my, my dignity and honor for these folks. I walk over there and I approach them and I said, um, excuse me, can you guys stop using the N-word? Now I said it, just like they said. So they understood what I was talking about. And, uh, and the teenagers kind of, they looked at me and one of the taller boys breaks out of the crowd and he comes face to face with me. He goes, and I go, and then he goes. <laughs> so we're doing this like all in split second. And then uh, he, he looks at me and he says, yes, sir. And then they, they collapse and go their way. And it's like, I'm like, yeah, all right. Because <laughs> on the inside, I'm like, wow! <laughs> so my, my, my point being is that part of, particularly as adults, we have to start taking responsibility for our young people because they're waiting on us to say something. That, that young man actually was trying to bait you into having some kind of meaningful conversation um, and it, it didn't have a chance to happen. Um, and so why do people get to call each other bad things? They don't, particularly if, if they're in my atmosphere. Um, I, I won't let you know girls refer to each other as the B word because I don't think that that is something that is affirming and, um, and uplifting. It, and, and my rule of thumb in terms of the conversations that my friends and I have, if I can close my eyes and if I can close my eyes, say the word, and see a good picture, then it's a good word. If you can close your eyes and, 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 and use that word, and you get flowers and daisies and bunnies and all that kind of stuff that come up for you, then it's a good word to use. However, if you get a different image, then, then you shouldn't do that. So how do you, as a, as a white person, relate to those black kids and, um, and educate them about the rules of your house is you have to be stern about the rules in your house. That's not the kind of language we use around here. Um, if you want to talk like that, you can talk about like that with you know other places, but that's not what we do here. Because we value diversity and we, devalu we value it in all sorts of ways. And that includes the music. Because the music is you know one of the gateways to some of this inappropriate, crazy behavior. There was a, um, a song that I heard that I liked on the radio. It was um, by uh, CeeLo. And it was on the radio, forget you, forget you. Right, that was the song. And then I heard it, I heard the unedited version. I was like, no! Right? I, I let that into my brain. Um, so, you know, we, we have to be critical. And again, understand that the times are different, right? The, the things that we thought were cool um, aren't cool today. We have to give some leeway, but we can't have standards for ourselves and for our families and the people around us. Um, and our core values dictate how those things how those things happen and what we allow in our in our system. All right. I was going to show a video. I don't think I have time for that. Um, so I want to get to the concepts. Um, the video was cute and all that, but uh, the concepts are more important. So one of the so the, in the video that I was going to show, and um, you can find this on YouTube. It's very easily accessible. Um, John King Jonas does this um, expose on uh, what would you do? And he goes into a Czech bakery in Dallas, Texas, and they have a Muslim woman who is trying to buy some apple strudel, and they have a, uh, a gentleman who is the, uh, the, the manager of the store who denies her apple strudel. And so what they find is that there are six people who are negative towards this woman who do not want her to get apple strudel. There are um, 13 people who, are, who go to her aid or to try to help her get apple strudel. And then there are 22 people who don't do anything. All right? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the negative sixes. Um, because I think you might have at least one negative six 
in your family or in your life. There's someone who's not politically correct or doesn't know how to say the right things or, or is oftentimes socially awkward and that kind of stuff. And typically, what do we say about those people? Or what kind of labels do we give them? That they're narrow-minded. What else? That they're intolerant. That they're bigots. What's that? That they're racist. Right? So we say those things about them, and once we say that about them, do they go, thank you? Do they get all warm and fuzzy inside and say, now I can help you with your blah, 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 blah? Is that what happens? No. What happens? They get mad. They get defensive. Do they, do they come and hang around you? No. Right? Do you want them hanging around you? No. Right? Um... And so typically what happens is that the negative sixes get disconnected from the rest of our human family. Um, and to be quite honest, sh should a Muslim woman be able to have access to apple strudel? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they should, right? I mean, everybody needs a good strudel. Um, now, if it was broom caca, that's something different. You know, I would, you know, or lutefisk. Yeah, I, I, um, and so, so the negative sixes are, are disconnected, and that the negative six behavior is, is a learned behavior, right? And in, in the clip, and, and you'll get a chance to see that if you're interested on, on, on YouTube, what, what you notice is that a lot of the older folks in this, in this video are these negative sixes. They're kind of set in their ways. And, um, and what do we know about human behavior? Why, why did the baby fall down? Because it worked, and it worked in the past, which means that it should work, and it will probably work in the future. And so these negative sixes have learned this pattern of behavior, that the behavior that they've exhibited has worked in the past, which means that it should work now, and it will work in the future. So when will the negative sixes change their behavior? Come on, come on, come on. We said people can learn, change, and grow, so when will they change their behavior? When they see that it's not working. Because we can tell them, but until they have that epiphany, it won't happen. All right. <laughs> the positive thirteens are very interesting because they are courageous, they're connected, and uh, they find allies. All right? Um, what is the precursor to courage? What must, what, what must one have prior to courage occurring? You must have fear, right? Anyone served in, in, uh, in our armed services at all? Please raise your hand, anyone? Okay, cool. One of the things that um, I, I appreciate those, those folks who serve because they get a lot of training around fear. They get a lot of training around fear. One of the things that, that makes um, servicemen and women capable of, of, of having fear and overcoming their fear is that they've practiced enough to expect what to do in times of emergencies, right? They, they, they work as a, as a group. They have allies that help them to carry out their missions. They, um, they, they, they get exposure to fear. And what is fear? What is fear? It's the unknown. All right? There, there are two um, pieces of fear that we have to uh, analyze and talk about. There is um, the ambiguity of knowing about what the future, so that, that emotional ambiguity creates that, that fear of the unknown, right? But there is also fear in terms of respect. For example, I will not jump out in the middle of this river because I respect the river. I fear the river, right? I, I know that it, can, it is greater than me and it, it, is, it can consume me, so I must have a, a level of fear or reverence for the river. And a lot of times, um, you know, I'll hear kids say this in particular. They'll say, well, I don't have no fear. I'm not afraid of anybody. You're psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have fear, you, 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 you know, I, I have fear for you because you'll do anything. Right? Um, and so the, the positive 13s are courageous, they, they understand their connections to other people, and, um, and they find allies to make sure that, that they're able to do something. 
the, the 22s are fearful, and typically what are, their, what are their fears? Why would 22 people not act when 13 would and, and 6 are negative? Why would the 22 not act? To avoid conflict, what else? Past experiences, what else? It's easier not to get involved. One of the things that I will give you is, uh, I'm sure you have been in a situation and you've seen something that was uh, outside of your core values, that was obtuse and grotesque, and you, you stood there in awe, and you went, ah. Or you didn't say anything, you just went, mm. Has anyone had that, a situation like that? Yeah. Do you know why, do you know why deer um, stop when they see headlights? They're startled. They're surprised. They're shocked. And so instead of doing something, they do nothing. Now, I want to do some training with deer so that when they see headlights, they're not so surprised. <laughs> Part of the reason that we don't act and we become 22s is that we haven't mentally practiced what-if situations. When military, when they do drill, they're always, okay, so what if this happens? All right, we're going to do this. What if this happens? We're going to do this. They have a manual for everything. You, they have a manual for the, what the, the degree of, of, of angle is for your sheet, for your sheets as you tuck them in. I mean, everything is just like written down, and they have every situation under control, which surprises me when we have, you know, Katrina. But anyway, um, so... So the 22 get caught up in this fear because they haven't practiced that. And so one of the things I would encourage you to do is to have these what if conversations with your family and friends so you know what, what might happen. Um, here, here's an example. Women. Have you had conversations with other women about sexism? It didn't have to be long conversations, but have you had conversations with women about sexism yeah. and its impact and all this kind of stuff. All right, I see a lot of yeses and nods of heads. All right, I'm going to ask a really weird question, guys. How often have you and other guys had a conversation about sexism? Doesn't come up often in my conversation either, right? <laughs> so if we're looking at trying to solve a problem, and half the problem is talking about it, but the other half isn't, it's going to be pretty tough to get rid of, huh? And so what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you know, men to talk with men about how to, to uh, be more effective in their relationships with women. And I'm going to ask women to sit with other women to talk about how they can better relationships with, with men. All right? Um, but I want to go back to this, uh, this, this negative six because... This is probably the most important point that I want to bring in the short time that I have. Please raise your hand if you are a good person. However you define that, raise your hand if you are a good person and raise it high. All right, great. So you are good people. One of the things that, that uh, I was watching... Um, Animal Planet. Anybody watch that? You know, Shark Week is coming up in October. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so I'm, I'm watching. Um, I'm, I'm watching Animal Planet, and they're following this pack of wolves, this coven of wolves, and, and they show them this little puppy, you know, and they're playing, tussling, <laughs> you know, so cute and, and stuff. And then they show them as, as teen wolves, and they're practicing, and they're, you know, they're rushing, rushing around with each other and tussling. And, uh, and then they finally showed them as adult wolves. Now, I'm not, this is like, you know, they must grow fast because this is an only 22 minute uh, program. <laughs> but, um, so, and I don't know why they're in danger if they grow that fast, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, so they follow these wolves and they're, they're on their final hunt, right? So, you know, I know we get 10 minutes left in the program, it's the final hunt and, and all this kind of stuff. And so they show the wolves and the strategy, and one wolf um, is supposed to jump up on the hind quarter of this, uh, of this elk. And so, you know, everybody's executing their moves, and the, the wolf does his thing. He's like, yeah, I've been practicing this all my life. So he jumps up and he goes, 
on the back end of the elk. And what does the elk do? He kicks them. Now, there are no ERs in the forest. <laughs> when the elk kicks the wolf, what happens to the wolf? He breaks his hip. What hap what's, the, what's the wolf's new destiny now that his hip is broken? Death. And so wolves know what we all know is that the pack is only as strong as the weakest wolf, right? And so he makes a decision to do what with the, with the pack? Does he stay with the pack or does he decide to leave? He decides to leave the pack. And he leaves because he knows it's better for the pack that he goes off and dies alone. All right? Human beings are much like those, those packs of wolves. Um, and what, one of the things that we do is when we have a, 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 a person or a wolf that is divergent from the, the majority of our, our culture, what we will say to that wolf is, we are too good, so we must separate ourselves from you. And because we're, we're, so, um, we're so much more social than wolves, is that when, when we cut off one of those deviant wolves or one of those racist wolves or bigoted wolves or sexist wolves, instead of just going off to die, what do they do? They go and find another pack. And once they join that pack, they find a pack that is just as sick and is, is, is you know, evil as they are, and then that pack starts breeding. <laughs> so not only do we have a pack of sick wolves, but this pack of sick wolves is now breeding more sick wolves. And I, I saw a number of you raise your hand and say that you were a good person. Because a, 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 one of the things I want to caution you is uh, those family members or those co-workers that we say are those, those bigots or they're disconnected, that uh, we have to keep them close to us because we're good people. My um, final story, uh, in, in high school, the kitchen is where everything happens. And, um, and so we'd do our homework there, my mother would cook there, we had a TV and an ironing board in the, in the kitchen, and we just hung out in the kitchen. Uh, that's where you did your homework, everything in the kitchen. And, um, and this particular night, I, uh, I had a, 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 a habit of laying my clothes out on the ironing board so that I could, um, you know, having creases was extremely important when I was in high school. Right. And um, my creases were so tight that I could actually cut people with my creases. <laughs> so, so having creases were important, and we were big ballers back then, so we had penny loafers that we would put quarters in. <laughs> That's how yeah, we were really balling in the big 80s. And so, um, so I leave my, kit, my, my clothes in the kitchen for, for the next day, and Thursday night my mom cooked um, catfish, and it was delicious. Oh, it was just absolutely delicious. Especially if you put enough red hot sauce on anything, it, it is delicious, right? So we, I drowned it in hot sauce, and, uh, and, and we had that for dinner and had a great time. But Friday morning, first hour algebra class, I had a problem. I hate Facebook. Because they keep reminding me of this problem. <laughs> What, what was my problem in first hour algebra class having left my, my clothes in the kitchen on the ironing board the night before? I smell like catfish. And Dolion and Dexter have not let me live this down to this day. They're like, bro, Mr. Hutt. That was uh, like a late night dive where you get chicken and stuff. And so they called me like chicken boy, you know. And uh, so I'm still living that down. Um, but why did my clothes smell like chicken? I mean, like, uh, like fish, catfish. They absorb the odor from the environment. All right? Now, I also had clothes that were in my closet in my bedroom that did not smell like catfish. Why? All right? They were, they were isolated from that particular environment, and there was a close proximity to the ironing board in the kitchen Comparably to my clothes in the in the in my bedroom, all right. So my, my, my clothes smelled like catfish because they were close to the catfish. Is that is that okay? Cool, cool. 
So I want to ask you a question. You said you were good people. What do the people around you smell like? Now, I know that's a goofy question, and I want you to explore that goofiness. But I actually, I want you to think about that critically. The goodness that you have isn't rubbing off on the people around you. Because it, 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 it's a rhetorical question, and I want you to think about it yourself, but it begs the question, how do I know a, a, a fruit tree? By its fruits. I see orange on an orange tree, I know it's a orange tree. I see apples on a tree, I know it's a apple, apple tree. If you're not bearing fruit, you're not then you're not a fruit tree. <laughs> right? my, my last point. What would happen if I took oranges from an orange tree and I created orange juice and I specifically and exclusively fed it back to the orange tree, what would happen? It would say an orange tree? You said it would die? Why would it die? What's that? It, it becomes caustic. What else? I took oranges and exclusively gave it back to the orange tree. Nothing else. Straight orange juice. From the tree, back to it. needs other things. It needs other things like what? Sunshine. It needs sunshine. What else does it need? Water. Orange juice, oranges, are not for the orange tree. Your goodness, whatever, however you, you qualify that, the dignity and honor that you have, is not for you. The talents that you have, the gifts that you've been given, they're not for you. Who are they for? Other people. An orange tree is no good if it can't deliver fruit that is ed edible to somebody else. <coughs> My name is Andre Cohen. I really appreciate your time and know what's on your tree. Thank you so much. Thank you.